Okay, hi everyone. So, uh, Jill, I guess I can just go ahead and get started. Um, is anyone having difficulty? Yep, sorry. Anyone having difficulty hearing me? Okay. All right, so um, super happy to talk about the Equifax breach uh, today. Um, of course, like most of us, I heard about it back in 2017 when it happened. Uh, when the congressional report was uh, released in December, uh, this past uh, holiday season, I spent sitting at home reading over it and just got more and more excited and interested about the level of detail that was provided. Uh, so that's what led me to want to talk about it uh, with the cybersecurity uh, community. So this is the uh, outline I plan to follow. Uh, I'll give you a bit about me so you know who you're listening to. And then we'll talk about the Equifax breach by looking at it first from the 10,000 foot level, then get into the details by stepping through the timeline and by examining some of the details that I've cherry picked. Uh, there's so much here that, that you know, we don't have time for it all, but uh, I've cherry picked some uh, that will hopefully give you a sense of the many different threads that exist and can be followed uh, regardless of the academic setting or the academic interests. Uh, the key takeaway I think today is that you know there's sufficient details available that this breach makes for an excellent case study of nearly any length and for a broad range of perspectives, whether it's uh, technical details that you're interested in or cyber policy or even uh, you know some some interdisciplinary ideas like how businesses interact and how it affects uh, cyber posture when you try to grow your business. So a little bit about me. Um, since August of 2017, I've been lecturing here at the uh, University of North Carolina in Wilmington uh, in the Computer Science Department. Um, in July of 2016 through the present, I've been involved with a cyber startup I uh, worked full-time from the summer of 16 to 17 before I started doing teaching full-time during the semesters. Uh, so I kind of, you know, do part-time with that during the academic year and then in the summers full-time. Um, so our CEO is Paul Shakarian. Uh, he's a professor out at Arizona State University. Um, Paul and I met when we were both at the University of Maryland getting our, our computer science PhDs together and then had spent time teaching at West Point together, uh, Paul and I having both been in the Army. Um, most of my adult time I've spent as a U.S. Army officer, so from 92 to 2016, and then in reverse chronological order of I think relevant jobs. Uh, you know, here's some of the things I've been doing. So I've been I've been in the community in the uh, field. Um, whether we were we were looking at IT modernization, my most recent job out in El Paso, Texas, uh, teaching up at West Point. Um, spent four years with the 82nd in North Carolina here. Uh, 15 months of which was a tour to Afghanistan as what we would call today as the CISO. Uh, back then we didn't call it that in 2006 through 2008. Uh, but but by, for all intents and purposes, that's what the job was. Uh, and then you can see some other stuff there. And if you're interested in, in connecting with me, I'm more than happy always to, to link up with other folks on LinkedIn. Uh, so that's my information there. Uh, so the Equifax breach. A um, lot of you are familiar with it. Um, 7 September, Equifax comes out and says, hey, we had a identity theft event and it impacts a lot of people. And uh, at the time, you can even go out on Equifax's web page today and you can see the two and a half minute video uh, that the CEO recorded because it was such a serious event and, and they were doing, maybe, yeah, they were probably doing a little bit of damage control, but also just trying to explain it in you know terms that the many consumers who were uh, affected would understand and then try to convey how serious they were taking this event. Uh, the attack, which started in, uh, I have a misspelling there, sorry, started in mid-May, uh, did not go observed or detected until 29 July. And of course, we'll talk about the details of that timeline and how that happened. Uh, the information that, that was stolen uh, includes a lot of PII, so first and last names, social security numbers, birthdays, and in, a, in many instances, uh, driver's license numbers, though that was not the majority. Um, the breach occurred because there was a flaw in something called Apache Struts 2, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there's the CV number there that was uh, released uh, when, it was, uh, when it was first um, disclosed by Apache on 7 March of 2017. And then just from kind of a, a single data point of how that affected Equifax immediately, 
um, their share price drops 13% the, the day after the breach was made public. So what was the, um, what was the reaction to the breach? Uh, these first uh, five bullets are just a selection of headlines that I think represent some of the places that, that people went, uh, journalists and politicians, um, you know, uh, why the effects breach occurred and never should have happened. Um, then, of course, poking the CEO in the eye because he, he, quote, oversaw the breach, you know, whatever that means. I guess if you're in charge, you oversee everything. Uh, and then when he retired, he was still set to collect 90 million. That ruffled some people's feathers. Uh, Brian Krebs, uh, in addition to writing some great uh, information about the breach, um, had a lot of things to say, including uh, some commentary on how they handled the breach once they tried to set up a response. And if any of you were affected and tried to hit their website, you, you probably know what he was talking about. Um, this fourth one's kind of interesting. I, I had not remembered this one from back in 2017, but when I was preparing this this uh, talk, I, I saw headlines where they were picking on the CSO uh, because she had been a former music major way back when. I mean, she was, I think, in her early 60s when she was the CSO, and um, it's kind of interesting that they were. this became a meme on the internet that somehow she wasn't qualified because she had, had at one time in her life uh, been a music major. And then, of course, Wired had uh, this bold headline, uh, Equifax officially has no excuse. And I'm, I'm bringing these up because this is the predominant theme of what journalists were saying in the tech industry and tech professionals. And, and I honestly want to push back a little bit. Um, you get into the details, I'm not so sure that it's so obvious that Equifax is this uh, simplistic boogie boogeyman bad guy uh, that you can just cast stones at. Um, when the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform came out, in this past December with their 96-page report, uh, these are some of the choice um, quotes that sums up, I guess, how they felt about it. They said Equifax had a culture of cybersecurity complacency, that the breach was entirely preventable, uh, and that Equifax failed to fully appreciate and mitigate its cybersecurity risks. And I pull out these particular quotes because, you know, when I look at this last quote, at first I agree with it, and then as I think more about it, I think you could replace the word Equifax with any company that, that suffers any breach. Um, it seems axiomatic. If you have something go wrong with you in the cybersecurity realm, then you fail to fully appreciate and mitigate your risks. I, I don't know how anyone, how this sentence could not apply to every single vulner, uh, exploit of any company uh, at any time. Um, the breach was entirely preventable. Um, I might talk if we have time a little bit about car accidents in America. Um, you know, you could think about all kinds of things that, you know, in theory are entirely preventable, but but are they really since since people are doing them? And then what does it mean if we're going to accuse a group of people going to work every day, nine to five, you know, washing their kids, sending them to school, um, you know, working hard, you know, of having a culture of, of cybersecurity complacency, um, you know, very different from, hey, not having seen the whole picture. So, um, this is kind of just, you know, this I think captures well the reactions uh, at that time. And then I feel a little bit differently now that I've read the details of the report. So this is the overall timeline uh, in broad, kind of a broad stroke from March to October 2017. 7 March, the Apache Struts vulnerability is disclosed. Uh, in 13 May, ASIS is breached. And um, talk about that in a second. Uh, 29 to 30 July is when the breach is discovered and ASUS is taken offline. Of course, lots of people had a lot of heartburn with this lengthy time between uh, when the thing was breached and when uh, it was taken offline. A lot of people have heartache with when the uh, vulnerability was disclosed and when the breach occurred. And then 7 September, Equifax announces the breach. Um, a lot of people have heartburn about how long it took from when the breach was discovered uh, to when they let the American people know. Um, what is ASUS? Uh, ASIS is this custom-built system that had been around for many decades. So the Fair Credit Reporting Act um, signed into law in 1970, which happened to be the year I was born, um, re resulted in all the credit bureaus having to put systems in place to handle these requirements. And uh, from what I could gather, it wasn't, ex it wasn't exact, but from what I could gather from the report, the ASIS system was built initially in the late 70s and then, of course, had been upgraded many times uh, in the ensuing decades. 
And the current ACES environment was described as being two web servers and two application servers with firewalls. Okay. So the details. So in March, um, CV 2017-5638 is disclosed. It's an Apache Struts 2 vulnerability. The next day, DHS US uh, CERT sends alerts to prioritize patching, and that email was received at Equifax. Um, it, was at, it was received by uh, several people, actually. Several people were on this um, e email list from uh, DHS US CERT. One of them was the CSO, Susan Malden, and also the Equifax Global Threat and Vulnerability Management Team. So, you know, what do they do? Um, Susan Malden, I'm sure, she doesn't say in the report, but I'm sure she, you know, she saw it among her hundreds of emails. Um, she may have checked in with the uh, vulnerability management team, but what the Equifax uh, GTA VM did is they have a distro of, a distro list of 400 people to whom they send whenever they get alerts, uh, guidance out regarding uh, vulnerabilities. And so they, the, the day after they got it, they sent it out to this distro list, was received by 400 people, and directed patching within 48 hours. Um, I'll, I'll read a little bit from the exact email. So this is a quote. Uh, as, ex as exploits are currently available for this vulnerability, and it is currently being exploited, it is rated a critical risk and requires patching within 48 hours as per our security policy. So, uh, you know, people got to work right away. They ran some scans. Uh, they didn't find anything. Um, the 10th of March, and this is something we only find out after the fact, uh, when the forensics uh, investigations are being conducted in August, uh, it turns out that as early as the 10th of March, um, some hackers did scan and detect and did a minor exploit of, this, of the Apache Struts Vuln that was related to ASIS. Um, they, as far as Mandiant knows, who, who was the forensics experts that, that looked into the logs, they, their instinct is that the hackers who did this on the 10th of March are unrelated to those who actually were involved in the data breach. Um, and the, the, the commands that they ran were fairly benign, uh, like who am, who am I commands, just to confirm that it was possible. And it's clear that, at least from what they've seen, uh, no data was taken at this particular time. So... Uh, and you got to remember or try to think about like, oh, what, you know, what were these dates? You know, this, I think the 7th was a, was, a, was a Wednesday, 8th was a Thursday, maybe it was Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But, uh, you know, this was the end of the week when, when all this kind of stuff's happening. So then come back to work next week, a different team, uh, different from the GTVM, the Emerging Threats team said, hey, we, you know, let's try to see if anybody's attacking us. So they, they created a snort rule, uh, put that on their systems. Uh, and they installed it on their uh, intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems. Um, following day on the 15th, uh, Equifax got from McAfee a new signature rule that was constructed specifically to detect vulnerable ver uh, versions of Apache struts. Uh, they used McAfee Vulnerability Manager and they scanned 958 external facing IPs. They did it twice. Uh, but again, unfortunately, they, they found nothing. Um, the following day, GTVM had a regularly scheduled cybersecurity meeting. This is the, one of their uh, monthly meetings where they pull they pull in the cybersecurity professionals from around uh, Equifax. Uh, includes many folks from the 400 plus email distro list. And then when the meeting was over, uh, so they highlighted the stress vulnerability during the meeting. And then when the meeting was over, they they distroed the slides as well. So uh, I just pause briefly to to remind you of what you know, the congressional report said, a culture of cybersecurity complacency. So, you know, did folks at Equifax do everything well? Clearly not, right? They were breached. Uh, but when I think of the words complacency, it, it does not make me think about these kind of activities taking place. Um, the level of effort that was put into it by a lot of good people um, just unfortunately didn't work out for them. Uh, I'm not excusing it. I'm just trying to maybe be a little more balanced uh, in evaluating this this circumstance. Okay. So um, May through July. So now the excitement of March is over. Um, March, the rest of March goes by. The rest, all of April goes by. Part of May goes by. 
And then uh, the logs show that on 13 May, um, ACES, which of course had this Apache Struts 2 vulnerability, is exploited. Uh, it's exploited for the first time. They drop some web shells uh, via the exploitation. And from 13 May all the way until 30 July, uh, hackers slowly move through Equifax systems. Uh, they conduct 9,000 queries. They look at 51 databases, uh, and this all occurs over you know about two and a half months. The result is uh, stolen data from 145 and a half million U.S. Co consumers and a little over a million foreign consumers as well. So. How did Equifax detect the breach, right? If they're sort of asleep at the wheel all this time, what, you know, what magic happened on 29 July? Well, it's going to turn out that it's a little bit of happenstance, maybe is the way often things turn out. Um, Equifax discovered that there was a uh, secure sockets layer certificate on an SSL visibility appliance um, that had expired back on January 31st, 2016. So that's you know, think about this. Uh, this is 18 months prior. So 18 months prior, some certificate on some device that was designed to allow them to see um, encrypted traffic had expired and whoever was in charge of that hadn't noticed. So this, this gets figured out. And then uh, at 9 p.m. local, down uh, near in the, the data center near Atlanta, uh, the Equifax countermeasures team, right? So remember, this is now the third different team we've heard about from Equifax who's involved in cybersecurity. Uh, the Equifax countermeasures team, uh, they upload 67 new SSL certs uh, so they can begin seeing all the different uh, traffic on the different connections that they've been missing for a while. And suddenly they can see uh, traffic. Um, now, why did, you know, one of the options, one of the kind of critiques uh, after the fact is that this visibility device uh, maybe should have had a different setting. The setting it had, which was default, was that if the certificate expires, uh, traffic will continue to flow. And you know, some people have weighed in and say, hey, this is, you know, this is one mistake. Uh, maybe the setting should have been changed to if the certificate expires, uh, traffic should cease flowing. That would have caused you know, some kind of a problem. Somebody either in the business or a consumer would have, would have raised a fuss and made, would have made it easier to recognize, oh, hey, we've, we've got these expired certificates. Let's get them updated. Um, when they reviewed the packet captures, uh, they notice suspicious traffic coming from an IP in China. So um, obviously now they're very interested in what's going on with the ACES system. So they continue looking at it on the 30th. Uh, vulnerability testing revealed problems, including SQL injection, uh, insecure direct object reference attack vulnerabilities. And at this point, it's a little bit unclear why the tests from uh, earlier in the year differ from the July tests, um, but it's just simply unclear. Um, but they continue to see additional suspicious activity uh, from another IP address that's coming from Germany, but leased to a Chinese provider. And so eventually, it leads them to decide that ACES needs to come offline. So ACES comes offline that day, uh, shortly after noon. And then uh, by 1.30, Susan Malden, the CSO, is notified and is said, hey, there's you know something's going on. And they have an incident management conference call. So she's kind of aware of what the situation is. Um, after she gets off the call, she emails the chief legal officer, and uh, who happened to be away on vacation at the time because it's it's the summer. Um, and so um, about 6:30 p.m. that evening, uh, the CSO eventually contacts someone named Graham Payne, who is a senior vice president, and this is the person who is eventually fired for this event. Uh, and he is the CIO for what's called a global uh, corporate platform. So uh, ASIS is one of the many systems that falls under his purview. Um, this person uh, informs the overall CIO, David Webb, uh, via email at 7 o'clock that night. By the next day, the 31st, uh, incident reporting makes it all the way up to Richard Smith. And now at this point, um, the most, I think, the saddest thing uh, to come out of the whole um, breach analysis occurs. And that is that in looking very hard at the ACES system, at looking very hard at the logs of what had previously been taken care of on that system, um, the security team realizes that that particular system had a Apache Struts 2 vulnerability the previous year, late 
2016 that had been remediated um, in January of 2017. So somehow between January of 2017 and March, uh, they lose visibility of the fact that ASIS has Apache Struts 2 running on it. Um, and, and there's a lot of things we can wonder about that. And, and if we have time, we'll, I think I'll bring that back up. Okay, into August. So uh, on the 2nd of August, Equifax realizes, hey, we have, we have a problem. So they notify the FBI. Uh, they contract Mandiant to come in and to begin a comprehensive forensics review. Um, Mandiant sifts through lots of logs, tries to understand the complex uh, IT infrastructure that Equifax is running and how it all connects. And of course, since um, these hackers have been working for 76 days, uh, they had a lot of time to make their way from one location to another. One of the things they discovered along the way, the hackers discovered along the way, was they came upon a, a clear text file uh, that had a list of usernames and passwords for other systems. So that initial vulnerability into ASIS that allowed them to the hackers to look at ASIS data uh, because they gained access to the underlying uh, machine and just found a file on there that some sysadmin was using uh, you know, as, a, as a shortcut to be able to copy paste um, usernames and passwords to, to get into other systems that they needed to manage. Once they found that, that's what allowed them to, been, to begin creeping further and further uh, along in Equifax's uh, infrastructure. So by the 11th, they realized, hey, you lost PII. Uh, on the 15th, the CEO is finally told, hey, consumer PII was, was stolen. And on the 17th, uh, there's a huge meeting between all these C-suite folks, the lead of ASIS and Mandiant, where they present uh, their findings that, hey, we've confirmed large volumes of PII has been compromised. So they get the brief together, they start thinking about how they're gonna handle this. They're, obviously this time they're still working with the FBI. And on the 24th, the CEO informs the board of directors. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of thinking about how to handle this, how to, how to mitigate it, but then also how to inform consumers and, and what should be done. So by late August, uh, Equifax realizes they have a huge problem and they have a lot of work to do to recover from the breach. So part of that includes standing up a brand new uh, infrastructure and website to handle all the consumer questions that, are, that there are going to be about, hey, was I affected? And the hiring of over a thousand people uh, to man a temporary call center that they uh, are gonna need to stand up. So um, coming into September, uh, they finally, Equifax and Mandiant, they do their best to finalize the list. They come up with 143 million consumers. Of course, uh, we know now that that number eventually grew to over 145 million, but this was the best they could do with at the time of, of combing through the logs, looking at the databases, trying to normalize all the data. Um, and then on the 7th, Equifax announced the breach. Um, after a week, uh, the CIO and the CSO decided to retire early or were encouraged to retire early. Um, some additional details are provided to the public. And you can go out on Equifax's site and you can still see these um, public uh, announcements, the, the PR releases. And then by the 26th, uh, the, CI, so the CEO uh, retired. So Richard Smith, CIO, CEO had been there since 2005, um, you know, working to oversee Equifax's uh, operations. Um, so after, you know, from 2005, 2017, about 12 years, uh, he wasn't quite planning to retire, but obviously because of the blowback, he retires. Um, on the 2nd of October, Mandiant completes their forensic analysis and submits the report to Equifax. And that same day, uh, Graham Payne is fired. And you can go out and listen to different interviews that he's given since then. Uh, he wasn't told why he was being fired. He was kind of just told to report to HR. You know, all his credentials were revoked, his badge was taken, and he was fired. Uh, he was sitting at home on the 3rd, um, still obviously very interested in this uh, event that was happening with Equifax, when uh, he was watching Richard Smith testify in C-SPAN before Congress, uh, and this Richard Smith was talking about, oh yeah, we had a human error, um, someone who should have forwarded an email directing people to implement a patch failed to do so, and that's why we had the breach. And of course, Graham Payne realizes at that moment that the CEO's gotta be talking about him, 
And, uh, you know, if you're getting the same thing out of listening to this that I got out of reading it, you realize that's a is a majorly gross oversimplification of what went wrong. Um, lots of people got emails. Um, Grain Payne was certainly one of them, and he certainly had overall uh, responsibility for ASIS. But it's very interesting that you know this is this is kind of where they laid the blame uh, for this for this failure. Okay, so that's a detailed timeline. Um, let's you know what what the heck was the big deal with uh, Apache Struts? So this is uh, this is CV 2017-5638. Uh, three slides. We're going to talk about this a little bit. Um, the Jakarta multi-part parser. So this is something that's built into Apache Struts 2. Uh, so 2.3x. And so really what this means is, so any Struts version 2.3.5 through 2.3.31, uh, they're all vulnerable. And you know when was 2.3.5 released? Well, end of 2012, right? So five years earlier. So this vulnerability has been lurking about for five years. Um, in addition to 2.3, the 2.5 series uh, also prior to 2.5.10.1 uh, has this problem. And what is the problem? So if there is an exception, if there's, a, if there's an error uh, in what, what's called the content type part of an HTTP header, um, when it attempts to handle the exception, it tries to generate an error message. And um, the error message generation actually allows arbitrary code to be run. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. And so um, it's fairly, you know, I, I say it's fairly easy. Once this was discovered, uh, you'll see it's fairly easy to replicate this. You just have to take uh, this command and set it equal to whatever string you want to run. And so when the error occurs, that command, in fact, will be run. So um, the problem, I think, is that it's easy to find vulnerable systems. Um, if So here's there's something called Google Dork. Some of you may already be familiar with this. But uh, it boils down to the fact that Google's web, web crawlers, you know, they, they're crawling across the web, looking at all the servers that will provide them with a response. So if a web server provides an error, um, rather than intended content, uh, and it say it displays a username, a password, database specifics, whatever, the crawler doesn't know any different. It just dutifully records it. So you know you have an error with your you know your web your dynamic uh, web app, uh, your web app your your website throws an error. Uh, the Google crawler is going to record that and then index it so to make it easier for searching. So in fact, to this day, if you were to copy out of my slides, uh, and there's nothing illegal about doing this, uh, this string and paste it into Google, you will see machines that are likely still uh, running web applications that have this Apache Struts 2 vulnerability in their web application. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily that all the ones that return have this, but I'm, I feel kind of, I haven't tried to, to run these exploits, but I feel pretty confident based on the research I've done that, that in fact, many of them still are vulnerable. Um, how do you exploit it? So once you know one or two proof of concepts were done and put out on the internet, uh, it really just is a matter of copying, pasting uh, some text, putting into you know your favorite scripting language, and sending this to one of the vulnerable sites. And the relevant part, let me see if I can highlight it here. Let's see if I can. So here's the here's the command equals portion. And uh, let me do it this way. Oops. Sorry. All right, let me just highlight this whole thing. So, uh, so what's going on here? Um, we've got my arrow down. There it is. Uh, we've got this command running here. And what does it do? It says, hey, uh, run this command, IP tables, stop. Right? So IP tables is a firewall on Linux. So it's going to say, hey, I want you to stop. Um, or service IP table stop. Or if you happen to be running this firewall, uh, I want you to stop. And so you know, all these commands will be run if this is a Linux box. The firewall will stop. And then a wget command. 
So wget from this IP address, a file named link. Um, I went ahead and, and, and looked, did a, did a trace route to where this IP is from. Uh, it happened, this particular one from the example that I pulled uh, happens to be from Seoul, South Korea. Um, so they send over, you know, you download this file link. I don't know what it is. They change it and then they execute it. And so then, of course, you know, it's doing something that some uh, person with probably ill intent wants to have happen on that machine. So uh, whether or not you understand all the details of this, you can see that it's nothing more than changing what is in the content type of the HTTP header and uh, whatever you is set to the pound command equals will be executed on the remote machine. So easy to scan and find a machine, easy to exploit. So, you know, what about this claim that, hey, you know, why wasn't this patched right away? Um, so first of all, uh, a lot of people just simply don't understand um, maybe, maybe patching in general, but certainly what it means to have to patch uh, a struts vulnerability. So how do we normally think about patching? You download a file, uh, you put it somewhere, then you restart an app or you reboot your machine and voila, right? Um, you know, I have an iPhone. Once in a while, I, I get a message that says, hey, something's been downloaded. You need to restart your phone. So I do it and apparently the magic takes place and my, my whatever vulnerability was of concern, it's been patched. Uh, not the case with struts. So struts is a infrastructure designed to make it easy to build web applications. And most web applications that have been built with struts too um, have them embedded. So they're, they're basically compiled into the web application. Um, unlike other system libraries, you know, other applications that use system libraries on Windows or Linux, where you just replace the library and then you, you restart the application, um, you have to go out and find the original source code that built this web app. You have to replace the struts you used with the struts they tell you is, is patched and is, doesn't have this vulnerability, and then recompile it and redeploy it. Well, what are we talking about? We're talking about web apps that developers probably declared victory on back in 2012, uh, you know, at the earliest. So from 2012 to 2017, people are building web apps, they're deploying them, they're putting them through their quality assurance process, whatever their, their software development life cycle is. Um, I think you know this kind of, oh, it's a critical zone, it needs to be patched in 48 hours, a uh, little bit of wishful thinking there. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip over this multi-part portion just because I'm looking at the time and I'd rather move on because I want to be done uh, with a little bit of time for questions. Um, vulnerable mitigation in general. So now I'm going to cherry pick some of my some of the topics that, that this Equifax case study make me think about. Uh, first of all, academic papers have shown that using CVSS score to prioritize results um, or prior to prioritize uh, mitigation efforts, it provides results that are similar to random. So, so really, CSS score is not a good indicator. Yeah, Apache Struts 2 had a, a CSS score of 10, but the problem is most vulns are never exploited. So here's a little pie chart of like all the vulns that we know about. Um, of all the vulns, 78% uh, of them never have a published exploit. And of the ones that have published exploits, which is 20, about 22%, only 2% overall ever are seen to, to be exploited in, in the wild. And if you look at you know, how CVs have grown since we've started tracking them, uh, you know, we're well over 10,000 per year now. And what's 10,000 per year? That's 200 a week. So you know, you're in the vulnerable management business. You have to look every week at 200 potential vulnerabilities, see if any of them apply to you, and then run them down. And this doesn't stop. It's every single day you have 40 to look at. Um, I found this super interesting. Equifax ran a patch management audit in 2015. So they had some folks come in, look at their process, and said, hey, there's, there's some problems with the way you're doing business. So they were aware that they had problems and they wanted to get better. Um, time just kind of ran out on them. Um, if you were to look at all these different things that they found, these are the eight key findings. The one that I find most surprising is this one right here. No comprehensive IT asset inventory. So they didn't know what they had. And this, of course, might have occurred to you when I mentioned that they discovered uh, in July that they had patched the ASUS machine in January, but somehow had lost visibility of it. 
Um, you know, there's a well-known quote from The Art of War. Many of you probably have heard. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. And if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will lose every battle. So I think, you know, this has got to be number one. It's so interesting to me. I would love to know. The report doesn't say why, uh, but I would love to know why this was prioritized either last or second to last uh, over some of these other ones. I don't know how you get better at patching uh, if you don't know everything you have. So um, very interesting detail. Um, okay. Kansas City Shuffle. So this occurred to me while I was reading this. So uh, you might recognize this guy here, Bruce Willis. He was in a movie called uh, Lucky Number 11 back in 2006. The Kansas City Shuffle, he's, he says, is where you make him look left and then you go right. So what's going on in March 2017? Uh, the week before, 96 high-level volts come out. The following week, 46 high-level volts come out, right? So this is where uh, Apache Struts is. What's among the high-level volts? Well, we got Adobe Flash, we got Apache Struts, and then we have this one here, CVE 2017-0143, also related to 44, 45, 46, and 48. Um, anybody recognize that? So this is the vulnerability that will eventually. I see the question. I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, uh, any? This is WannaCry. And if you look at what happened, when did WannaCry happen? When did the attack occur? It occurred 12 to 15 May, right? 12 to 15 May, this is the same time that those hackers who, who exfiltrated all that data um, from Equifax, this is the same time they attacked Equifax. So was there a little Kansas City shuffle going on? You know, I don't know. It's pure speculation on my part, but I find, the, I find it very interesting that both of these things occurred at the same, same time frame. Um, based on time, I'm going to skip this one. Just note, like, you know, I think the CEO was doing a good job at what he was asked to do in terms of growing um, the business for Equifax. I think you can make an argument that, uh, you know, his priorities were right. Should they have been more focused on cybersecurity? Yeah, probably in hindsight, he said, thinks that now. But uh, certainly wasn't some guy being lazy and not doing his job. And then, boy, you talk about the threads you could pull or follow to do a you know, a single lesson, a half-day seminar, a full-day seminar, a week-long, even a semester-long course. Like, who's to blame? Is it Equifax? Is it Apache? Is it the government? Is it the hackers? How about cybersecurity researchers who put up the uh, proof of concepts? What about consumers who want free services and don't realize that by allowing their data to be collected, that's how they get it for free? Um, all kinds of uh, interesting things we could talk about. Uh, one thing I will mention is, you know, is it time to start thinking differently about how we want to punish these folks? Is it possible to make a deterrent? You know, what's the penalty for hacking a big company? Um, you know, should it be more severe? Um, you know, or are we just learning to live with stuff as we do auto accidents, right? 30 to 40,000 people a year are killed in the United States due to auto accidents. We know why. People speed, don't wear their seatbelts, or they drink. That's the vast majority of why people are killed. Um, okay. Uh, sorry about rushing there at the end. I just I love talking about this stuff. Um, so, Abu, you're writing, any advanced preferred obfuscation methods techniques to detect evasive malware? Um, so, in the context of this particular breach, I thought it was interesting that a lot of IT folks had great suggestions about, yeah, it was, it was, you know, so it would have taken a lot of effort to go back and rebuild web applications to compile in the new Apache Struts 2 version that you needed. But there are all kinds of things you could have put on the front end that inspected uh, the content type fields of every HTTP header before you allowed it to process. Um, I don't know if that's a good answer, but it's 150. I want to stop on time. Um, so I, I don't know as far as admin goes. Does the next speaker just take over at uh, 150? Is anybody out there who can answer that? Okay, I guess not. Um, I guess time's officially done, but any other questions? Okay, um, I hope 
that you found this very interesting. If you, um, you have more interest or you know want to know any other things that I was thinking about in terms of like how someone might run a semester-long class in cybersecurity that covered all these different areas, um, you know, happy to talk with you over email or to get on a phone call. Um, I hope. I guess these slides will be available to you all if you find them useful or interesting. Um, and then parts that I didn't get to, if you got questions about those, feel free to email me as well. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to stop talking. And thanks very much for the opportunity.